Good morning, everyone. Let's get today's lecture started with some questions that you may have. Any questions from the last two, three lectures? Okay. So uh, we start from this uh, H of uh, H of nitrogen. Uh -huh. nitrogen. We begin with the HN proton. Yes. And then we Sir, jumping means what means if we pass it through the inner tank and go to the CH of the I minus one curve. That's right. So what do we mean by that? Is that would you agree that this will be transferred through an inner? We are talking about H and C is C O C A. So let's draw the previous. So the red is the ith nucleotide. Green is the I minus one nucleotide, right? I hope you are following this one. You have the choice of jumping to this carbonyl carbon or this carbonyl carbon, since it's Hetson COCA, right? From your knowledge that you have gained so far, which coupling do you think will be stronger? The one bond NC prime coupling or the two bond NC prime coupling? One bond, that's right. So the one bond is the more stronger one. So what you would do right now is to do an inept between proton and nitrogen. And after that, you will do similarly. Either you get T1 labeling there itself. Remember how we were talking yesterday? While the T1 labeling happens, you can transfer it to carbonyl. You transfer it to nitrogen, do the T1 labeling, and transfer it to carbonyl carbon simultaneously. And then the carbonyl carbon, you can transfer with another polarization transfer to CA, right? So this way, what you have generated is that you would only go to the HN to the I minus one CA, right? In this way, we are just avoiding the labeling at CO. We are what? We are avoiding the labeling at CO. Yeah, we are not labeling uh, carbonyl carbon. You could potentially do that. That will make it a four-dimensional NMR experiment, right? So you start with HN. Pt to N, then Pt plus chemical shift labeling of nitrogen in T1. We saw the constant time module. Then you ended up transferring everything to the C prime. Let's also write the index. So you started with I, I, and after this, you go I minus one. Then with another Pt, without chemical shift labeling, you go to the C alpha of I minus one. Right here, you could do T2 labeling and reverse everything back and get T3 in HN. That's the HN COCA experiment. Okay, makes sense. Yes. On the other hand, the HN CA experiment transfers from the nitrogen to both C alphas simultaneously. The coupling of this end to this C alpha, I think, is like 11 hertz. This end to this C alpha is like 7 hertz. Sir, so what is the difference it is making between H and C if you are jumping this CO? And then I can... Good question. Remember, what will be the scalar coupling of the NC? This is about 15 hertz. Right? On the other hand, this is about 11. Between durations. You're talking, let's take an example of 10 so that the math is easy, right? One over 10, uh, two times 10 milliseconds is going to be what is the question. So you can ask 1000 divided by two times 10. So it's about the transfer of this one to this one is about 50 milliseconds. Set it to 50 milliseconds, there's a partial transfer here also because that also has seven hertz coupling. That is why if you take a look at the HNCA experiment, the sensitivity for the I to I is about 50, while the I to I minus one is about 15, about one third. It's not as efficient, but you still do get some signal. The difference in intensity also helps you understand which is the previous and which is the present. On the other hand, here if you're transferring through 15, you realize that from here to here is about five milliseconds. Here to here will be about 33 milliseconds. 
C to C is about another 35 hertz. Okay. And the advantage that this offers is that you will only transfer from here to here and you will not transfer here. This is picking and choosing on what you want to achieve. And therefore, use that information to get sequential assignment in the protein. Yeah. Any other questions? The question is that, that is being raised is how do we decide which which spectrometer to use? That's his question. Let's take the example of Iser Bhopal. We have a 400 megahertz. We have a 500 megahertz. And we have a 700 megahertz NMR. Now the question to him, for from him is that what, when do we choose 700 versus 500 versus 400? Let's answer this question one step at a time. Anybody wants to take a stab at it? How would you choose? How many of you feel it's a valid question? Raise your hand. Yeah, good. Basically, you have more choices. So how do we choose this question? It's an important question. Depending on sensitivity, what we want to choose. Sensitivity is one parameter. Okay, let's ask who is a rabbi? Yes, sir. So when, so would you want high sensitivity I mean, high concentration sample at 700 megahertz or low concentration sample at 700 megahertz? Relatively lower. <laughs> okay. So basically, if low, choose high B naught. Why is that so? Uh, because the sensitivity is high. How? So How does the sensitivity high. go with B naught? B naught power 3 by 2. Excellent. It goes as B naught power 3 by 2. So therefore, if you have a lower concentration, going from 400 to 700 is going to give you a boost of 7 over 4 power 1.5. This is significant. Let's say it's an 800 megahertz so that the math is easy. 800 by 400, the power 3 by 2. So basically, 2 power 3 by 2. What is 2 power 3 by 2? 2 root 2. What is 2 root 2? 2 times 1.4, which is about 2.8 times. What you are able to realize is that if, if your sample has lower concentration of the solute that you are trying to observe, it might be a good idea to go to higher magnetic field strength just because B0 helps you. So sensitivity or the concentration of the sample is an important variable. Anything else? Sorry? Spectral. spectral width. How would a spectral width play a role? Does spectral width and PPM change across spectrometers? Okay. So your answer is hidden there. Number of? Frequency. Number of? Frequency. That's the concentration, isn't it? The N is in concentration itself. We already said if you have lower concentration... Side of, side of Size of the molecule, okay? So what would you want to comment? If small, if large, which spectrometer will you choose? Why? Sorry? Better resolution. Can you give me an example? How does resolution increase when you go from 400 to 800 megahertz? How many of you agree with this point that if its molecule is large, I want a 700 megahertz? I'm not sure about the resolution thing, but for bigger molecules, we have uh, faster relaxation. Okay. So higher B0 would help in. But that's the first point. We have already done there. Right? But apart from that, Irrespective of size of molecule, low concentration, or anything that impacts sensitivity, you want to maximize. So we are already done with that point. Sensitivity is sold. 
Good, that's the word, better resolution. But you have not still told me how 800 megahertz has a better resolution than 400 megahertz. Your answer is right, but you're still not told. Kaushal. I was thinking of the uh, relaxation. Uh, I was thinking of the relaxation. No, relaxation is going to exist. There are other reasons of relaxation which I'm not discussing in the course. So what is 1 ppm in a 400 megahertz? What is 1 ppm in a 800 megahertz? Therefore, within 1 ppm, you have 800 hertz in 800 megahertz, 400 hertz in a 400 megahertz. Right? You're packing more frequency points within a single ppm. Does that increase your resolution? Right? So that's the whole idea here. Therefore, what you're able to realize is that as the size of the molecule increases, you want on a higher B0 to get a better resolution. Right? Apart from that, we had discussed about B0. There's also some other important parameter to choose. Which probe to use? If you generally use a low field magnets, you'll only have room temperature probes. On the other hand, if you are using higher field magnets like 600, 700, 800, 900, or 1 gigahertz, you have the opportunity to use cryogenic probe heads. Meaning that you acquire the signal, receive the signal at 20 to 25 Kelvin, which improves the sensitivity further. Okay? Which is why for biomolecular application, people tend to believe a higher field strength because it helps in B0 factor. It helps in getting more resolution given that the number of peaks are more and the line width also becomes a problem as you increase in size. And additionally, you have the ability in terms of hardware to get cryogenically proved, uh, cooled probe heads, which help you give even more better sensitivity. So this gives about two to three times more sensitivity. So if you're going from 400 to 800, you got about 2.8, let's say three times better sensitivity. With the cold probe, let's say you get three more times sensitivity. Overall, you're getting about 10x more sensitivity going from 400 megahertz RT probe to 800 megahertz cryogenically cold probe. The advantage is also getting a better resolution, right? While we have spoken about the positives of going to a high field, we should also talk about negatives of going to a high field. Can anybody think of what are the negatives of going to the high field or what limitations exist? The cost. The cost of a high field magnet is much higher. Okay, to achieve a B naught of something like 16 Tesla is much more expensive than achieving something like eight Tesla. The engineering is easier. Things are much cheaper. There is also a hidden cost that we don't directly see, which is the, the necessity to maintain the superconductivity magnet at that temperature. At higher magnetic field strengths, you need more liquid helium. Therefore, the consumable cost also increases. As much as I said, the hardware is a huge benefit. This also comes at a huge cost. The cryogenically probe Probe heads are about two to three X more expensive than the room temperature probe. Okay. I hope you guys also heard the hardware lecture. There's something called a Q factor of a probe that helps you get better sensitivity when uh, that's a hardware property. The Q factor of a probe indicates how much sensitive is it to salt concentration differences. The cryogenic cool probe Unfortunately, it's very sensitive to high salt concentration, meaning that it'll start to not behave as you want it. It don't give 2x to 3x more sensitivity and the pulse width starts to increase and other problems start to come up, okay? So as much as you have advantages going, you also have some disadvantages. One of the disadvantages, which I'll just mention and move on, is that especially for the carbonyl carbon, the chemical shift anisotropy is high. What do we mean by this? If you're thinking of an electron cloud around this carbon to be spherical or around any atom is more or less spherical, since you have a carbonyl group that's being present, it will pull the electron cloud more towards the oxygen itself due to electronegativity. So due to which the electron cloud will be less spherical, meaning that it will be less isotropic 
Therefore, the chemical shift anisotropy will be high for the carbonyl carbon, meaning that the relaxation rates will also increase with the B0. So not always you improve sensitivity for all spins when you go higher in B0, sensitivity and resolution. There are cases where when you go higher in B0, the sensitivity and resolution reduces. For instance, whenever you have higher chemical shift anisotropy. As much as I said this, there are also other advantages that come. For instance, the same aspect of chemical shift anisotropy helps for nitrogen in something called experiment, uh, put, doing an experiment called transverse relaxation optimized spectroscopy, where one would be able to get even more narrower lines. Let me show you. This aspect came up when I was mentioning, this is a very large protein, which is 405 residues. Okay. You are talking about something like um, how many kilodalton? So you're uh, having something like 110 Dalton per amino acid. So you're talking about 110 times 400 uh, Dalton is the molecular weight. So you can say 11 times 40 kilodalton. I'm just taking the zeros out and making it kilo, right? Let's assume it's 10. So you're talking about a 400 kilodalton protein, which is a large protein. The moment you do the HSQC, we are not only able to see the number of peaks increase, but you are also able to see there is an extremely poor resolution that comes because the R2s increase. Interestingly, the nitrogen proton, as much as we are talking bad about the CSA, the CSA and dipolar relaxation. Dipolar relaxation means relaxation that happens to the attached proton. So these two are the major mechanisms for R2 relaxation. Interestingly, when you actually do the HSQC experiment, you get a single peak. You guys remember this for every NH. But in reality, if you don't decouple on the omega-2 and omega-1, you end up getting four peaks. If you actually take a look at the width of these peaks, it's very interesting. This peak will be very broad. This peak will be narrow. This peak will be broad in that dimension. This peak will be brought in yet another dimension. This happens because you are talking about the DD and CSA interfering destructively with one another to reduce R2 for that given peak. This is a natural phenomenon that happens. On the other hand, here DD and CSA work together to make the relaxation go even faster. So the line width will be broad in both the dimensions for this peak, but the line width will be narrow for this given peak when you don't decouple. And interestingly, here only one will be broad while the other will be narrow. Here only the proton will be broad while the nitrogen will be narrow. As much as you guys are able to believe, if you carefully follow the density matrix formalism, you have the ability to pick only the highly resolved peak by carefully turning off the decoupling in F1 and doing something called phase cycling. What it does is to get the transverse relaxation optimized spectroscopy. What do we mean by this? You end up taking a parameter for which the transverse relaxation is the most optimized. It has a wrestle relaxation rate. You have less relaxation rate. You have narrower line width. You have narrower line width, you have high resolution. So, interestingly, what people have found is that as you go higher in magnetic field strength, so let's say from 600, 700 to 1 gigahertz, the trozy effect, which I've just explained to you in the last few minutes, is the higher. So, as much as CSA is bad, there are some places where CSA is also helpful for us to exploit. What is DD? DD, dipolar relaxation. So for, that's what I was trying to mention. If you're looking at 15 and relaxation, it's going to be most relaxed by the proton that's next to it. That's a spin-spin relaxation, right? The coherence of 15N will be destroyed mostly by the, co the presence or absence of coherence on proton, right? Let's say you have so much money, next to a person who has no money, the no money person will take try to take your money. That is, the person who's closest will take most of your money. Right? So that's how DD, uh, dipolar relaxation works. 
dipole dipole relaxation that's why it's dd csa on the other hand is how is the electronic cloud different right close to the nuclei make sense these can work together or work against each other they work against each other you can have a much better resolved resonance right and therefore if you are able to see comparison of these two parts clearly the trozi experiment is very helpful so where did we start we started by asking how do we choose a certain field strength i hope i have given a more complicated answer meaning that it's not one factor that decides what you should do if you have a small molecule if you have 400 500 it's very difficult to tease apart between 400 and 500 either i mean both would give something similar it's not very different i'm not saying that the 400 500 won't help the resolution improvement is substantial but not great on the other hand 400 700 will be very significant the sensitivity improvement to 500 from 400 is not much again but sure it will help we have those other options so generally at in an nmr center people will equip things with different probes what they would do is to keep the 400 let's say with a broadband probe which can look at any nuclei from the periodic table on the other hand the 500 will be more or less dedicated to carbon and proton so that you have the ability to get any nuclei mostly it's driven by proton nmr therefore that also you can work simultaneously makes sense so the and at the same time there could be cases where you don't have any option so therefore you have to go with this now at that point when you are going with it the feasibility of whether you will be able to get data that's good in sensitivity and resolution is going to be troublesome let's say we had only 400 megahertz we cannot properly do biomolecular nmr spectroscopy here makes sense so that's a loaded question i'm happy that you asked this question so keep keep thinking about what options are there what is your sample and therefore how do we choose makes sense yeah any other questions is scalar coupling a type of dipole dipole transition by the way yes it is but i once again it it also ends up relaxing because think about it you would end up defacing right so it would end up causing relaxation which is why you want to decouple at times not just to improve resolution even if you don't have a high resolution you will still put the 180 to make sure it doesn't end up defacing right makes sense like the trozi experiment mm mm-hmm. whether the we are actually using hsqc uh, pulse scheme or whether you are using a trozi pulse scheme along with as hsqc uh once again for to go into the detail we'll take a much longer time it's very very similar to the hsqc you start with an nf and transfer one of the major differences that you will have here is that you will not have the 180 in the proton okay the pulse program looks very similar okay and uh, the phase cycling will be different between a hsqc and a troc to get the troc peak let's leave it at that for the time being okay okay sir but the idea is very very similar make sense okay sir today i'm going to touch up one of the most important experiments it is called the nuclear overhauser effect spectroscopy nuclear overhauser effect which is called the noe spectroscopy okay this is one of the very cool experiments because unlike the other experiments where we ended up transferring a polarization from proton to carbon or proton to nitrogen or carbon to nitrogen or nitrogen to carbon and vice versa this is an experiment that does not rely on coherence transfer through the nf pathway i'll quickly draw the pulse program don't waste your time doing the density matrix formalism so 90x 90x with the t1 labeling this looks similar to the good cozy so you add only one more 90 degree pulse and you have an acquisition with a constant time delay this tau m delay is called mixing time as much as you guys would be very inquisitive to go do the product operator or density matrix formalism to it <laughs> it's very simple to think about this experiment where the t1 is set to 0 which will be the first indirect dimension point right 
when you're thinking about that experiment, do you realize both the 90s are applied right after each other? So it's going to act like a 180 degree pulse. So basically this experiment is like a 180 degree pulse. You have a tau M and a 90 degree pulse. What does that remind you of? 180 time and 90 and acquire. What does that remind you of? Which pulse program is that? Did we see that pulse program in, in, in any context? Check the relaxation. Very good. To determine the T1 relaxation. It's called the inversion recovery experiment. You invert to the 180, have a certain time and see how much it recovers. Right? So this experiment is very similar to the inversion recovery. So writing some density matrix is not going to help you right away. Meaning that, let's say that you have 180 and you have a tau mix, what's going to happen? It's only going to change the length of the vector along the z-axis. You're not going to get any x or y terms, assuming that the pulses are perfect. And then you're ending up applying a 90, what will you get? Right? So this experiment requires a different methodology than the density matrix formalism. Okay? The pulse is on resonance for... Let's assume all the protons are on resonance. You have a very high power pulse and the off resonance is very small. No, no, that is chemical shift. But let's assume that the omega 1... See, let's ask that question again. So let's say omega 1 is 25 kilohertz. This is a number I've been using throughout the course. Okay? Let us say that you have a, a chemical shift spectral width of 10 ppm on a proton. Okay? Let's take a 500 megahertz. So that is going to translate to 5,000 hertz. Right? So you're talking about the tan theta as something like 25 by 5, which is about, it's about, it's equal to 5. So theta would be tan inverse of 5. This is not very high. Isn't it? Meaning that you are still going to have an effect that's very similar. The 80, 90 degree pulse will be 85 degrees or something like that. It's not going to be very different. Okay, so as long as you have a high power pulse and very small offsets, things will be okay. Okay, and remember, this also an offset that does not make sense because if you have a 5,000 hertz spectral width, you're going to divide it as plus minus 2,500. Is that correct? You will keep the carrier at zero hertz and you'll do plus minus 2,500. In which case, this goes 2.5. In which case, this goes 10. Right? So clearly, we are almost always on resonance. And you can always try to... And there are some spectrometers. Remember, the 25 kilohertz comes up when you have a 10 microsecond long pulse. For organic molecules, a pulse width will be about 5 to 6 microseconds, which will translate to 50 kilohertz. So slowly, what I'm trying to make you understand, with omega-1 being high, capital omega being small, the off-resonance effects can be kind of, for now, right? There are definitely effects, but if I start going into it, then it goes to something else. So let's not distract ourselves. So overall, you see that this is a very naive looking pulse program. And what does it achieve? I'll tell you what is the end goal for this. The nosy experiment, if there are two protons that are within or less than five angstroms in distance, in the 2D spectrum, what you're going to get is that, let's say this is the first proton. Let's call it proton A and proton B. Shall we do that? So omega A, omega A. It's a homonuclear correlation experiment. So what is that peak called? Louder. Very good. It's called the diagonal peak. And let's say this is omega B. And for current purposes, let's assume that these two are not scalarly coupled. J, A, B and J, A, B equal to zero. So therefore, you don't have to worry about cozy right now. The interesting aspect of the nosy experiment is that if they are within five angstroms of each other, you will get cross peaks. If they are not within five angstroms of each other, you will not see a cross peak. And the more interesting aspect of this is that the intensity of the cross peak or the volume of the cross peak is proportional to 1 over the sixth power of the distance between them. Therefore, if you're able to get the intensity, if you're able to have a reference uh, distance with an intensity, you can get other intensities and therefore convert them to distances. It's like a calibration curve. Right? So that's the power of the nosy experiment. What is the power of the nosy experiment? 
this simple looking pulse program helps you find which set of protons are actually within a certain distance between one another. Okay. And I just showed you a moment earlier that the density matrix formalism is not going to be useful. Right? Because we are dealing with longitudinal magnetization in this case. Go recollect every experiment that we have discussed thus far in this course exploits transverse magnetization. Right? So that's what makes this experiment slightly different. And it's also a very important experiment because if you are able to find in a macromolecule which atom is close to which other atom in the spatial orientation, you actually get tertiary structure information. What is tertiary structure? Let's rewind a bit and ask what is primary structure. Primary structure of a protein is its sequence of amino acids from the N terminal to the C terminal. Secondary structure is one where how does this primary structure organize itself into alpha helices, beta sheets or loops? The interesting aspect of alpha helices is that I and I, I plus fourth residue have an interaction called hydrogen bond. On the other hand, beta sheets don't have any specific depends on I and I plus four or whatever. It, it's a longer range interaction and only if they're close and form hydrogen bonds, they come next to each other. Slowly, what you're able to realize is that, oh yeah, the nosy experiment would help me understand which parts of the protein are close to each other, slowly giving you an information of structure. True? So the important aspect of this is that the 2D NMR experiment, the 2D nosy experiment, provided a paradigm shift in the field of biophysics in the 80s. As much as FTNMR, we only dealt with FTNMR in this course, before uh, Fourier transform NMR, there was continuous wave NMR. And it was by Richard Ernst in the mid-late 60s where he proposed pulse Fourier transformation NMR. Pulse NMR where you could Fourier transform data to look at how do the systems behave. And the advantage of that was that you could get data much faster. You could get them in a way where a single excitation gives you everything. That was one of the major jumps. And we are also able to realize the moment you start using pulses, you can actually develop a theory where you can even predict what should be my outcome and therefore construct pulses, delays, and phases in a way that you can extract something. True? Right? So these were the initial changes, but one of the biggest change was contributed when the two-dimensional nuclear overhouse effect spectroscopy was implemented. There's a little bit of pride in uh, ourselves also, given that one of the Indians ended up achieving it in Kurt Wuthrich's lab. Okay, it's Professor Anil Kumar from IIC who's retired right now. He was the first person to actually implement a 2D nosy to show within a protein one can actually get cross peaks that gives you distance information. Until then, only 1D nosy was there. Let's keep away from history for the time being. Yes. Um, so why five times? We will come to that later. Okay, that depends on something called cross relaxation. I doubt other I will be able to go there today, but that's what we'll finish off on Wednesday. Okay, then I'll tell you how nosy and chemical shifts could be used to get uh, tertiary structure of proteins. And then we'll have discussions like this and wrap the course up. We will see after we go through the formal understanding of how nosy works. Okay? Yeah. So, going into, so you said that we can't use density matrix formalism. So we're going to yeah, we are trying to see. I just applied the density matrix formalism for you. It's an X phase pulse with T1, which is going to have chemical shift evolution and whatever. Then you another, apply the another X phase, it's going to go to the longitudinal axis. Plus X or minus X will take it to plus Z or minus Z. Just that it will definitely be away from equilibrium given that some relaxation will happen in T1. The moment you are in a non-equilibrium state, what does the mixing time do to allow for these distances to build up is the question. That type of formalism we have not developed that far. And all other experiments we discussed use R2, or rather the transverse magnetization. We didn't discuss, this is all longitudinal right now. Right? Of course, I'm not drawing something important. The D1 delay exists. Almost no experiments I write that explicitly, but that does exist. Right? Okay, in order to do this, we need to take a step back. What is a step back? Let's go back to a simple spin half system. And I'm drawing for gamma greater than zero, like I've been doing for the entire course from the beginning, right? <laughs> what is the change of population of the alpha state? Let's assume 
the transition rates are given by a factor called W. Pretty sure all you guys have done chemical kinetics enough. The change in alpha will be minus W times population in alpha. And then plus W population in beta, meaning that depending upon the population and the weight of this frequency factor, you lose from alpha, therefore the negative sign. And depending upon the population in beta and the power of this weighting factor, you're going to gain from this, right? There's a small issue here. What is the issue? The issue is at equilibrium, the net change of alpha will be zero, correct? If that is indeed the case, immediately this takes you to the wrong assumption that the population in alpha and beta are equal. This is wrong. Correct? Populations are not equal. They're unequal. If they're equal, you're not going to have spectroscopy. They're very similar, but they're unequal. So therefore, this equation has to be slightly modified where you have minus, dub, minus W N alpha minus N alpha naught plus W N beta minus N beta naught. What do we mean by this naught here? Is the population in alpha, N alpha, at equilibrium and beta at equilibrium, right? So therefore, what will end up happening? This implies at equilibrium, n alpha minus n beta will be n alpha naught minus n beta naught. Okay, that agrees. There is a population difference and they are not equal, right? And the important aspect that one has to realize is that the MZ magnetization comes up due to the population difference in the alpha and the beta states, right? And therefore, the rate of change of magnetization dMZ over dt is going to be given by d over dt of n alpha minus n beta, right? Let's take these are linear, so therefore, I'm just doing this, right? So what is going to end up happening here? dmz over dt will become minus, uh, sorry, will be, I'll just borrow whatever we had here and then move it right here. And remember, minus d and b will be the same thing again because d and beta over dt will be equal to at equilibrium, what is going to happen will be minus dn beta by dt because the sum of them should be equal to zero. Is that right? All right, so what is going to end up happening here is that you're going to have something like minus w, actually I can write it together, minus 2w n alpha minus n alpha naught minus n beta minus n beta naught. Okay? I just took both of them. Do it calmly once you reach your room. You'll be able to understand this. This is what ends up coming. Let's quickly rearrange this. To get N alpha minus N beta minus N alpha naught minus N beta naught. Shall I do that? If you guys calmly look at it, this is nothing but what we had used blindly to derive one of our early equations. I didn't derive it at that point, but I hope now you guys are able to understand what is the rational behind using a first order rate constant. Unlike for transverse relaxation, where we just said dMy over dt is minus R2 times My. Here we didn't do that. We added the initial condition. At that point, how did we rationalize? rationalize? We said that initially you had nothing in the transfer, so we put it to zero. Initially you had M0, and therefore you put it in. That's how I rationalize. Now we, we are able to understand how this comes up. We were able to uh, integrate it and understand how does mz of t changes as a function of time. Right? We had done this long back. Right? Why did I do this? It's because we are going to follow the same type for the nosy experiment. Okay? The only thing here is that we are trying to talk about two spins i and s. The moment you have two spins, you're going to have alpha, alpha, 
ஆல்பா பீட்டா பீட்டா ஆல்பா பீட்டா பீட்டா ரைட் அண்ட் ஹியர் வாட் இஸ் கோன் ஹேப்பன் would be this will be for omega i why did i say omega w i is because only i and beta yes yes thank you here only s ends up changing from alpha to beta we will call it let's say o here it will be w s to where the probabilities of these transitions could be different but remember the the energy difference will be one and the same if you guys might remember right with the change in the scalar coupling only and the way i have indicated is the scalar coupling is small but anyways and then here is going to be wi2 wi1 okay and importantly this will be called w2 so y2 because double quantum transition and this will be w0 equivalently right okay now that is there we have to ask what is n alpha alpha over dt that is going to be minus ws1 n alpha alpha minus w i 1 n alpha alpha minus w 2 n alpha alpha all i did first was how does a alpha alpha population change that's what i put first that's why all of them are negative signs properly weighted by their respective entities here right now we'll say recovery of it that's going to be plus ws1 n alpha beta plus wi1 n beta alpha plus w2 n beta beta <laughs> as much as we ended up invoking the fact that you cannot have the populations to be similar and you need to in include the equilibrium population let's not complicate our life by writing the equilibrium population in each of this right now we can always do the entire derivation and put it in the end i'm following whatever keeler is doing i'm going to quickly switch to the keeler book i'm just trying to give you an idea how these equations are written and what do they mean okay now i'm pretty sure you guys are smart enough to write for n alpha beta by d n alpha d n alpha beta by dt n alpha d n n beta alpha by dt d n beta beta by dt you calmly sit you will be able to write right it's going to have some some part like that now we have to slowly start writing operator same way we wrote mz is n alpha minus n beta m and n m and i we are interchanging right now i did this for a simple two spin system isn't it right you can also say i z is an alpha minus n beta <laughs> right here we don't write m any more because the magnetization has a very different meaning the bulk magnetization is not very easy to use any further right what is that going to be that this one is going to be n alpha alpha minus n alpha beta basically the difference between this plus the difference between this oh so sorry i think i'm making a mistake n alpha alpha minus n beta alpha the difference between these two that's the i transition correct so far so good plus n alpha beta minus n beta beta the population of i will be decided by the energy difference in these states similarly one can also write the sz part of it which is going to be n alpha alpha minus n alpha beta plus n beta alpha minus n beta beta only these two have swapped if you are able to realize okay one more term that keeler likes to write let me also write it will be 2 iz sz how will this be given we will just take this part and swap it for the sz part the negative sign will come here 
okay and the positive i think this will also remain uh, negative or positive i need to check but basically the two iz sz will be n alpha alpha minus n beta alpha and i think it, he will just swap these let me check whether i'm correct literally following that sometimes writing so quickly yes i'm correct might make me make some silly mistakes why are we writing only the z terms we said that the nosy experiment predominantly relies only on the longitudinal magnetization and therefore we want to understand how do the different z terms look one thing that's missing here is identity identity will be nothing but n alpha alpha plus n alpha beta plus n beta alpha plus n beta beta we set the population to 1 the sum of all population should be equal to 1 0 and 1 will be the range of population that one can see okay <laughs> so now what's going to happen you guys are able to see there are some interesting parts here which are also present here right you can literally use this parts and try to write all these given equations in terms of these operators true you have n alpha alpha n alpha beta n beta alpha and n beta beta which are also represented four variables represented in four other variables correct so now let me go to what keeler had written let me directly write it go back and check it n alpha alpha will be one fourth of e plus iz plus sz plus 2 izsz let me check what does he represent as 2 2 alpha beta is representing as 2 alpha beta is representing a 2 n alpha beta will be 1 over 4 e plus iz minus sz minus 2 izsz n beta alpha will be 1 over 4 e minus iz plus sz minus 2 izsz i did it it all works out the only reason why i'm not doing it that's going to be unnecessarily laborious and you guys know how to do arithmetic i want to teach nmr here and not how to add 2 plus 3 right that's why i'm doing this and beta beta will be 1 over 4 e minus iz minus sz plus 2 izsz with all these defined can you guys go back to n alpha alpha by dt d n alpha alpha by dt with all these defined you can put this back up right similarly as i copied this one let me also copy the next one i request all you guys to do this over the weekend i planned it in such a way so that when you do it you'll be convinced this will be a sure shot question in the end semester exam okay why am i out in the question because to understand this is very important okay it's very very crucial so i'll write it finally this is going to be minus omega one let's see what did he define as omega one he uses one two three which i don't feel is intuitive so omega s of one plus omega s of two plus w2 don't have to write it i'm going to share this i see minus omega w2 minus w0 s z minus w s oh there's some mistake i'm doing the s indices might not be entirely right let me check please go back and check whether the s indices are right there might be some issues that are coming up anyway uh, might have done some silly mistake here and there Okay, so this is what you end up getting for DIZ over DT. Previously, for a single spin, you only thought that it changes depending upon what was IZ itself. But slowly, what you are able to see, the recovery of I spin also depends upon where does SZ fall. Remember, we have not included the SZ not yet. The moment you do that, you will be able to see it. Let me also write the exact similar equivalent of S. It will be very similar this will be minus w2 minus w0 of iz minus 
W. Yeah, I think I made some mistake with the indices. Please take a look because wherever I is getting S, I'm getting I. There's something wrong going on, but that's not a big deal. That will not take the outcome of this message. Yeah, I think there's some mistake that happened. The way he's defining it is slightly different from the way I would define it, or we defined it. So D I two I Z S Z over D T will be minus omega S. You sit and derive this, things will come nicely. Okay? But they are just the same similar equation written over and over in some other ways. Let's try to understand this equation a little bit right now. Come back on Wednesday and touch base. So my request would be to go take a look at the 8th chapter of the Keeler's book, which has a lot on relaxation. Okay? I'll try to upload this section on the classroom so that it's easy for you guys to learn. The main important aspect of this is that the I spin not only recovers from itself. So for the current time being, let's ignore the two I Z as E term. Okay. This will only happen when the transitions have very different frequencies for the I spin. Okay. For, for the time being, let's assume that the probability of these two happening, omega S I and omega S2, omega S1 and omega S2 are one, W S1 and W S2 are one and the same. In which case, this kind of goes to zero. The important message here is that the recovery of longitudinal magnetization of I not only depends upon how far it is from equilibrium. So why do I say from equilibrium? Minus IZ naught will come. Here, this will become SZ minus SZ naught. So this is an important message. The recovery of I not only depends upon how far I is from its equilibrium, it also depends upon how far it is from SS equilibrium. You can imagine this as a test between two people to ask whether they are friends or not. Let's say A and B, we are questioning whether they are friends or not. I take a lot of money from A. Now the question is whether B will give money to A to help A recover. A and B are friends, that will happen. Correct? Yes or no? But if they are not friends, it's not going to happen. The friends part of it is like distance here. The transfer of polarization from I to S is the transfer of money in this analogy equivalent. On the other hand, if we switch the scenario, we take money from B, the same amount of money B gave to A when A was poor, A will also give back to B. This depends upon how thick their friendship is. Two ways. Unlike human friendships where things don't have to be equal both ways, thankfully for these spins, they're all equal. If A talks to B, B talks to A the exact same way. Right? So we will try to see a little bit more on how does a nosy experiment therefore is very useful. Slowly we have built it upon that. This part will depend upon the 1 over r power 6. And therefore, as much as I is away from S, the recovery will depend upon how far is the R, and therefore the buildup on the nosy experiment, the cross peak, will help you find the distance between different spins. So please go back, take a look at the Keeler's lecture. So here you go. This is chapter eight. If you see, he tries to start by saying, what is relaxation? I exactly did this. Rate equations and rate constants. And here you are just trying to see what is NB, N alpha, D N alpha by DT and D N beta by DT asking how do they change and what is the relaxation. This is exactly what we derived. And of course, he goes on to talk about the consequence of DMZ over DT, which you have already done the earlier part of the course. Okay, and he also gives an example of the inversion recovery experiment, which we discussed to measure T1 rates, right? With that being done, he goes to whatever we just discussed today, similar to the block equations. These equations are called Solomon's equations, which looks at rate of change of longitudinal magnetization. So go back, sit and do this. This is exactly what we did. 
it's rather simple. Just that instead of using alpha, 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 beta, beta, alpha, beta, beta, beta users one, two, three, four. So carefully take a look at it, use it. This is the final equation that we looked at. And here you would end up talking about the equation that we quickly discussed. My request would be if you could read the next sections that come, that will help you a little bit understanding what's coming up. Okay. Thank you very much. Happy Diwali to everyone.